this for me. Welcome to What the F is Going On in Latin America, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of Latin America and the Caribbean. We broadcast every Wednesday, 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern on Code Pink YouTube. For this episode, I am happy to tell you we're actually broadcasting from the Caribbean. We are, um, I'm sitting here uh, on Corn Island off the Nicaragua um, Caribbean coast. And my guest is Erica Takeo. She's coordinator of Friends of the ATC. And she's joining us from Managua, Nicaragua. So we are talking with you from Central America, um, mainland Nicaragua and Caribbean coastal Nicaragua. So Erica, I'm so pleased you had time to talk with us today. And um, just for our audience, I'd like everybody to know that Erica and I just finished, principally Erica, I have to say, um, leading a 10-day uh, delegation here in Nicaragua. Um, it was a Friends of the ATC uh, partnership with Sanctions Kill. We spent 10 days studying uh, the early sanctions regime the US has placed on Nicaragua. Um, sanctions regime meaning economic warfare against Nicaragua. We started in Managua, we went to the Northern Caribbean coast, we've been in homestays, in campesino communities. And so we have a lot to talk with you about today. But first I'd like Erica to uh, tell us about Friends of the ATC. This is a really significant week for them. It's their 43rd anniversary. So let's talk about the ATC and then we can talk about our travels and what we saw and learned. So welcome Erica. Great, Carrie, thank you so much for having me and having me participate in, in this program on behalf of the ATC and the Friends of the ATC. Um, so yeah, to give a little bit of introduction, um, the ATC stands for Asociación de Trabajadores del Campo or in English, Rural Workers Association. It's an organization that, like you said, is celebrating its 43rd anniversary this week on the 25th to be exact. And um, it's an organization that um, has lived through many moments of Nicaragua's history. It was created in the 1970s to organize um, farm workers and peasants as part of um, the different forces that were in the insurrection to overthrow the Somoza dictatorship, which was a family dynasty that basically owned and controlled and repressed Nicaraguan's peoples for almost um, half of a century, backed by the US government. And so the ATC was founded as um, part of the unification of a lot of popular sectors in Nicaragua that were done with having a dictatorship and looking for the construction of national sovereignty. Um, also want to remind the audience that the Sandinista revolution takes the name of um, Augusto, Augusto Cesar Sandino, a man who actually wasn't alive when the revolution triumphed, but was alive in the 19, 1920s. Um, organized a group of guerrilla fighters to kick out one of the many uh, U.S. Marine occupations in Nicaragua and who really had a vision for national sovereignty and for anti-imperialism and unity of Latin American peoples. So the FSLN took up a lot of the, his ideals and implemented them into their historic program. And the ATC as an organization specifically to represent rural workers was a part of that historic process. Um, then the ATC was played a big role in the 1980s in organizing the agrarian reform, which redistributed about half of the country's arable land in the country. So families that had previously for many, many years never had any land, now had land to grow food for their families and for their communities. But of course, um, this first phase of the, the Sandinista revolution was, was heavily affected um, by the US financed uh, counter revolution or what we know as the Contra War which really, um, despite the ATC and the, and the San Diego Revolution's efforts to implement a lot of things, um, created lots of problems. It was a very really violent and bloody war. There were 50,000 deaths. And so um, there were really amazing things that happened in the 1980s, you know, not just the agrarian reform that the ATC was involved in, but also you know, literacy programs, health brigades, et cetera. But there was also a lot of violence, a lot of blood spilled and a lot of deaths. Um, then in the 1980s, um, a couple, a couple important things happened in Nicaragua and, and with the ATC too. Um, the FSLN lost the elections in the 1980s, um, peacefully handed over power to, to uh, one uh, neoliberal government and then followed by two more 
Um, it's one of the few examples in the world actually where a um, leftist movement that has come to power through armed revolution has peacefully passed over power. Um, and the ATC took on a really um, important character in leading um, the continuation of the Sandinista revolution in the countryside, defending the gains of the agrarian reform especially, and also took on an international character because they joined together with um, peasant organizations from around the world to form an international movement that's very, very well known today that's called La Via Campesina. It's the movement that coined this concept of food sovereignty or basically the right of peoples to define, create and defend their own food systems outside of the interests of agribusiness and transnational corporations, um, which was particularly becoming or coming to the forefront of an issue because um, with the growth of neoliberalism, but also of the implementation of more free trade agreements that were making food a commodity rather than a human right. So then um, the ATC struggled um, in the neoliberal time period until 2006 when the Sandinista, the Sandinista party came back um, into executive power under the leadership of President Daniel Ortega. And since then has played um, a really important role and continued to organize farm workers and small farmers in the cooperatives through um, unions and also agricultural cooperatives and has some very, very active programs in training youth and organizing women. So it's a very long time period, <laughs> many different phases of history, but it means that there's also a lot to celebrate this week as we celebrate the 43rd anniversary. Thank you so much. It's been really um, phenomenal, the 10 days that we were traveling with you and your um, compatriots at Friends of the ATC who were the backbone of our delegation logistics and just watching and witnessing how the work is done, particularly um, in the in the rural uh, communities. But first, Erica, can you uh, tell our audience um, FSLN, FLSN is the Liberation Party, Frente Sandinista Liberacion Nacional, just so our audience knows what we're referring to. Um, let, so let's start with um, why we're here. We, um, we had this idea to educate, <laughs> we had a pretty wild idea actually, to, um, to bring a group of people to Nicaragua to study what is going on here regarding US foreign policy, specific foreign policy in the form of economic warfare. And I know a lot of our, many people in our audience will uh, are familiar with the 60 year blockade economic war against Cuba, um, very uh, strong sanctions, economic sanctions against Venezuela, uh, beginning December of 14 and more specifically March of 2015, accelerated in August of 2017. And so we're starting to see the same form of warfare accelerate here in Nicaragua, which is why um, you and I wanted to bring a group of people here to study this, what this looks like in its early phases. And so we were in Managua for several days. We had several government meetings. We, we were able to come to a better understanding of um, Nicaragua's access to foreign loans, restructuring foreign debt, qualifying for loans to um, respond to COVID-19 and, and respond to the hurricanes um, last fall those loans are not available to a sanctioned government. So we studied that. We went to um, two rural communities. Well, hold on. Is that better? Yeah, so just, I I just yeah, okay. Just a, sorry, everyone. We had just a little glitch with our internet connection regarding sound. So you can hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay, so then we also went to um, two rural communities, one in Esteli and one in Hinotega. Uh, uh, Esteli, which the principal industry is tobacco, Hinotega, principal industry is coffee. We uh, then went on to the northern coast of the Caribbean to study the, um, after a, the results of the hurricane and how the governments responded and also to study the beef cattle um, issue which has become controversial in the United States, uh, conflict beef, and we can tell you that 
there's very little conflict involved with this beef and this labeling of Nicaraguan beef is basically served to close the US market to Nicaragua, to this Nicaraguan product, which is also a form of economic warfare. Um, so let's talk, Erica, a little bit about what, um, what we saw, I guess probably for our audience, we had some very strong government meetings, um, but one of the things that I think everyone enjoyed the most, and there were 13 of us on this trip, was going to rural communities. And I mean, we, particularly in Esteli, we like got up at sunrise and worked. <laughs> we, we planted pitahayas, learned about that as a unique um, crop. It grows only in Nicaragua and it is cultivated for export to the United States, actually, the fruit, it's a succulent. There is a short little video that we've done on the propagation of that crop. So why don't you tell us a little bit about the importance of these rural communities as the backbone of the ATC and also how um, the productive, the, the private, or I, shouldn't, I don't wanna use private, the individual land ownership families being able to own their land for cultivation um, creates food security. And that also is gonna be um, a buffer against um, the onslaught of sanctions that we're anticipating against Nicaragua. Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, this is, um, as, as the name ATC would suggest, the rural areas is really the heart of where ATC's base is and the ATC's organizing is in is in rural areas with um, peasants, small farmers. Um, and the backbone for this is really what I mentioned when I introduced the ATC, the agrarian reform, which provided land to lots of families who uh, previously had never had land. And having the land is the basis for being able to grow food uh, for one's family and for one's community. Um, the ATC uh, takes on a lot of different roles in rural areas. Um, as Terry saw in La Montanita, which is a community just outside of the department capital of Esteli. Um, the ATC has a couple of uh, multi-sectoral unions as well as farmer cooperatives in the area. And one of the big areas of interest um, and of organizing that area recently has been what's called agroecology, which is basically a model of agriculture that's an alternative to conventional methods of agriculture that are very focused on lots of chemical use, monoculture, um, meaning just a couple of different crops rather than diversified systems um, that are really based upon um, the legacies of what we call the Green Revolution, which was particularly imp implemented after World War II as a way to make use of chemicals that had been used in war and now they needed, to be, uh, they needed to make a market for it. So they decided to use it in the industry of food, which is totally wild and totally crazy um, and totally inappropriate to defend life of peoples, but also for Mother Earth. So um, the ATC has been organizing in that community to make basically uh, an agroecological demonstration farm, which Terry participated in one of the workshops that was that was taking place there, which is basically how to support communities that are in um, what's called the dry corridor of Nicaragua, of an area that's particularly affected by climate change and that um, we'll have less and less rain every year, as well as more extreme climatic events. When it rains, it'll rain way too much. Um, so how to have farms um, and farming families that are more resilient. So that includes um, lots of the, the implementation of a lot of soil and water conservation practices, diversification of production, um, integration of animals into the farm. So uh, Terry saw the example. Definitely. Of raising <laughs> pigs, a way of raising pigs. Live right with them. <laughs> called the deep bed model, yeah. um, as well as how to include the whole family in, in um, participating in farm work, which I think that Terry also saw very much um, in, in the example there. So the ATC accompanies families um, in this whole process of the countryside. But as you were so importantly mentioning in your question, um, the base of this, the ATC does this in La Montanita, but they do it in so many other communities in Nicaragua, there was half of the group that was also in a community called La Virgen, which is in the coffee producing region of Hinotega in the northern part of the country and other parts of the country. And these, um, all of these different processes and different popular organizations supporting the production of food on land owned by peasant families 
means that Nicaragua, um, Nicaraguans consume about 90%, um, about 90% of the food that Nicaraguans produce. Sorry, I'm getting this all mixed up. About 90% of the food that Nicaraguans consume is produced by Nicaraguans. And about 80% of that is produced by small farmers, by peasants. So the agrarian reform, families having their own land to grow food is really the basis for food sovereignty, which is really, really key, as you say, as a tool against any kind of imperious aggression, because oftentimes imperialist aggression will immediately attack a country's food supply. But it's very, very difficult to attack a country's food supply if it's basically a democratized food supply, if it's divided up um, equally and locally between communities and the way that that food is distributed is very locally. Um, Nicaraguans don't buy food very much in their supermarkets. They buy it from the local markets, from their neighbors. It doesn't go very far out of the community. It might go, the farthest it might go is the, you know, the department capital and some of it might go to Managua as well, but um, it doesn't really go into you know, the supermarket chains or the corporate controlled chains. So that's, so that's really, really key when we think about Think about sanctions and imperial aggressions, and there's already been, you know, a couple of examples here in Nicaragua of uh, living through that, including the 2018 two coup attempt in which um, the opposition tried to put roadblocks, or they did put roadblocks around the country, which stopped the dis distribution of certain kinds of products, but never stopped the distribution of food. You know, in the United States, for our audience to hear, oh, everybody just shops at their neighbor. They produce their own food or they just go and shop, you know, with their, uh, with the locally produced food and in the States, that's a very, um, you know, what do we call that eating within, you know, no more than a hundred mile radius of your, uh, you know, the food's not uh, produced farther than 100 mile radius from your home or the restaurants you choose to frequent. And it's a very, uh, almost, um, a luxury to eat that way in the states it's expensive and it's i think you could even uh call it an elitist um diet in the states whereas here in nicaragua this is just how this is how the food is produced on small local farms this is how people produce their food this is how they eat and um it's just an amazing thing to witness i think Regarding sanctions, there's two things in, in, in having, you mentioned 90% food sovereign. So this means the country is not susceptible to an import, to um, having imported food products blockaded from the country. And also getting off the chemical farming means that there is doesn't, one, there's no um, additional uh, environmental damage to producing the food. But also, as we've seen in Venezuela, chemical agriculture, fire his fertilizers, pesticides, some of those countries have been sanctioned, prevented from selling their product to farmers in Venezuela. So again, you have this sovereignty through the whole food chain in Nicaragua, which is fabulous for the people to be producing on this level, but also is a buffer for any sort of economic uh, warfare that we know is already in place and, and accelerating. So let's talk a little bit also about, um, let's talk a little bit more about the dry quarter because we don't talk enough about climate change in the US and the dry quarter does have some effect on um, what the US narrative is regarding quote unquote, conflict beat. So what is the dry corridor and, um, and what's, and it's expanding. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah, so the dry corridor refers to a region that actually spreads throughout the whole Mesoamerican region, goes all the way to Panama. That is, a, that is an area, well, as the name would say, um, it's kind of um, desertifying um, or drying out with, as one of the effects of climate change. Nicaragua and Honduras are some of the countries in the whole entire world that are most affected by climate change. Um, and so, as I mentioned, when I was talking about the case of La Montanita, it basically means that these regions are going to get less and less water. Um, the dry seasons are gonna be drier and the rainy seasons um, will have longer periods of dryness or drought. And when it rains, it's gonna be a whole bunch of rain at once. But the challenge with that means that <laughs> A lot of the agricultural system relies, relies on water to be able to produce food for the country. 
Nicaragua is pretty well off in the sense that it already has the base of people to grow food for the country. But if there's not water, good distribution of irrigation systems, which most, most families don't have access to irrigation systems, which are very, very, very expensive, um, that puts it at a very, very high risk um, for, you know, for these very extreme climatic events. Um, a good example of that being the two hurricanes that took place last year, hurricanes at the Neota in November of last year. Um, let me just tell our audience that there is that we did an episode of what the F is going on in Latin America, November of 2020, with Dr. Paul Oquist to talk about the Nicaraguan government response to the hurricanes. And we juxtaposed that with the second part of the program with Gerardo Torres from Partido Libre um, in Honduras to show just how um, the Honduran government privatized neoliberal form of economy was not able, did not respond, and uh, versus the response to the Nicaraguan government. And that you can find on um, our YouTube channel under videos. And it's worth listening to, to understand the response, how profound it was. And we did witness some of those communities on our trip. Anyway, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you. <laughs> no, that's, it's absolutely right. I highly recommend that interview too. I think it's an excellent and gives it a, a very important compare and contrast between two neighboring countries. Um, and so um, in terms of the conflict beef issue, um, first of all, I wanna really recommend that people read an article that was published by John Perry with support from the Tortilla Con, Mal Tortilla Con Sal Media Collective um, that was put published in FAIR. Um, that Fairness and accuracy and reporting. Yes, thank you, Terry. Well, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's provides, okay, sorry. that provides a whole, um, a really, really important um, background or outline about this conflict big story that came out a couple of months ago in a number of media, me, US media sources. It was picked up in other countries as well, including the UK, and goes uh, myth by myth, basically debunking a lot of the different issues that are being completely manipulated in that piece. Um, one of which is, Terry, you're mentioning the topic of the dry corridor. Um, so basically the conflict big issue is basically this accusation that in the time of the pandemic um, last year, um, the US um, needed to import meat more beef um, and they started to import more beef um, from the country of Nicaragua. So Nicaragua was exp exporting more beef to the US, but the accusation is that that beef is all coming at basically the blood of indigenous slaughter and massacre of indigenous peoples as you know big scale livestock producers um, take over indigenous land, particularly on the Caribbean coast of, of um, Nicaragua, which is where the majority of um, Nicaragua's indigenous population is. But um, in relation to climate change and the dry corridor and something that was emphasized by um, the uh, coordinator of the regional autonomous government of the northern Caribbean coast, Carlos Aleman, said, um, of course, there's cattle, <laughs> there's cattle production in the Caribbean coast. Um, you can't lie and say there's no cattle production, but there's a number of decent reasons in, in that for that, including the fact that, you know, the expansion of the agricultural frontiers in part because of the dry cord on the, along the Pacific coast is making agriculture more and more difficult to practice. On the other hand, he also mentioned that a lot of people are practicing, you know, that have livestock on the Caribbean coast, particularly because of all of the advancements thanks to um, both the national government and these processes of the San Anisio, San Anisio Popular Revolution that have implemented lots of different social programs, um, especially the, the importance of infrastructure and good roads that go into very rural areas. But Some also- Some of the best roads in Latin America, I will add. Excellent <laughs> roads here in Nicaragua. Excellent roads here in Nicaragua. And also the process of building regional autonomy that's really focused on indigenous and Afro-descendant communities being able to control their communities, make their own decisions. And that also includes the right to be able to have livestock. So, you know, I think um, it relates both to climate change, but it also relates to these other really important processes of autonomy on the, on the Caribbean coast, this, this topic of conflict beef, as well as another, uh, a number of other issues that I don't, I don't know if we have time to get into today or not, if that's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's talk a little bit about, let's talk a little bit more about the indigenous communities on the Caribbean in these autonomous regions, because it's a part of the country that I think most of our audience probably um, is not that familiar with. Um, it's profoundly beautiful. It's a, it, I mean, it is definitely Caribbean, 
versus Mesoamerican Pacific Coast. It is a, it's fantastically beautiful here, but it is definitely a Caribbean culture, uh, you know, heritage-wise and, and everything. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit more about these communities. Also, um, before we completely leave the conflict beef issue, one of the things we learned uh, in Billy is that cattle is a banking system, is a form of banking for the people in the autonomous regions. And can you explain that a little bit for us? Yeah, uh, sure. Because I mean, it's really fascinating that it, it's used as investment in banking for people. Yeah, well, this is something- And not on a large scale, little family, you know, small families. <laughs> this was something that um, was explained to us by, again, by the coordinator of the regional government, Carlos um, Aleman Cunningham. Um, who had a really excellent meeting with us. We talked a lot of about a lot of different aspects of the Caribbean coast and this process of constructing constructing on autonomy. But um, he really emphasized, you know, the importance of communities, especially indigenous communities um, that can be very remote, that might ha not have um, bank accounts or access to banks or other ways of storing, you know, their funds. Um, but buy up cattle and have cattle, which can sell for a good price. And so if you know they need to save something up, they might buy some cattle, have them, and whenever they need to, you know, pay some kind of big cost or anything, they can they can sell the, the cattle. But it's really not, um, the, the folks on the Caribbean coast are not, uh, the majority of them are not raising cattle, um, thinking about thinking about exportation, it's, uh, sorry, export. <laughs> They're thinking more about, you know, consumption, local consumption in the community, as well as, like you said, this new interesting thing that we learned about that, you know, being their own, their, their own banking system. Yeah, that was fascinating for me to learn that and really important actually. So when we, uh, when, when our delegation went to Bowie, we flew from Managua to Bowie. And when we arrived at the airport, we had to go through customs and immigration because this is an autonomous region um, with its own governments, its, its own uh, management. And let's let's talk about the structure, how these autonomous regions are structured, because this was you know, we didn't physically leave um, Nicaragua, but we did enter a new zone and we did go through um, customs and immigration when we arrived and when we left. Sure. Yeah, definitely. So so Nicaragua. Um, for folks who don't know, is in the middle of the Central American Isthmus and it has coasts both along the Pacific. Um, the Pacific Ocean and the Caribbean. Um, and, and it's in part because of that, that the US has always geo, geopolitically been interested in Nicaragua and they actually wanted to build a canal in Nicaragua before they were able to build one in what we call today Panama. Um, and uh, about half of the country, uh, half of the national territory today in Nicaragua is um, part of what Terry is talking about, this autonomous region. Um, the Caribbean coast divided into two parts, the northern, the northern Caribbean coast autonomous region and the southern Caribbean coast autonomous region. It has its own regional government. Um, and uh, really the base of a lot, about a lot of these, uh, of, of the autonomous region are the territorial and community governments, which are basically, um, to take a step back, um, with the triumph of the San Anis Revolution and the creation of a new constitution, um, the, the constitution recognized the importance, uh, basically recognized Nicaragua as a plurinational nation. So there are mestizo peoples, but there are also indigenous and Afro-descendant peoples coming from different pasts and different histories and recognizing that their histories, their languages and their territories need to be respected and also have a legal backing behind them. So one of the processes of the San East Revolution, which is also part of the FSLN's 13-point um, historic program, has been basically how to respect all these different components of the Caribbean coast and indigenous and Afro-descendant populations. That has included giving land title to hundreds of indigenous and Afro-descendant communities. So they're um, most of the Caribbean coast and there are parts of the Pacific coast too that are indigenous or Afro-descendant territory, um, communally held land title by those peoples, each with their own distinct way of governing um, with local community governments that make up a territorial government, 
but each distinct to um, the different people. So we have um, the Mesquito indigenous peoples, Mayagna, we have Creole, Garifuna, and Mestizos as well on the, on the Caribbean coast. And a lot of this process of constructing autonomy has been res respecting local ways of governance and using that base um, to inform what's happening higher up on the higher levels of government, both in terms of the regional autonomous governance, but also the national government, because it's not like the, the it's not like the national government has no presence in the Caribbean coast. It does, um, but it really respects the autonomy of the regional autonomous government. And the way that it, you know, is supporting what's happening in that area is, is for example, with the passage of the hurricanes, the national government sent over 500,000 um, uh, sheets of um, metal roofing to help repair houses. They sent lots of boats. Within 10 days. Within 10 days. Within 10 days. Yeah, they sent both. They sent food. They sent a lot Got of the things electricity to help. restored. Exactly. So yeah. they played a really big role, for example, in that, um, in terms of the you know immediate recovery process. But at the same time, like Terry says, it really feels like a whole different, um, whole different culture and whole different place in comparison to the Pacific Coast. Yeah. It, it was just fascinating, and um, as you know, I'm spending a little more time in the Caribbean. <laughs> It's 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 was just really fascinating uh, for us to study such a wide uh, variety and to learn how diverse and culturally rich Nicaragua is. I know a lot of people, particularly of my generation, when we hear Nicaragua, we so much think of the Sandinista Revolution of the '70s and the Contra War of the '80s. And to have worked with you, to have brought 13, well, 13 with you and I, so 11, 11 people um, here to um, see the diversity of this country and learn so much on the ground that's happening here. It was just really, really a gift, Erica, for you and the ATC to um, welcome us and put the trip together because we, <laughs> it just was, uh, I, I have to say, you know, we really, um, we learned so much but it was a very adventurous trip too, you know. So physically adventurous, but also just all the, the variety of people, places and things that we saw. So for our audience, um, I just wanna let, uh, let everyone know that this uh, delegation was uh, March 13 through March 23rd with a two day, three day, two night add on to Corn Island. And um, it was a project of Friends of the ATC in partnership with Sanctions Kill. Um, both of those organizations have fabulous websites, friendsoftheatc.org, sanctionskill.org. And just a little bit about Sanctions Kill. Sanctions Kill is a coalition of over 100 um, international organizations focused on um, hybrid warfare, uh, U.S. foreign policy, economic policy, and warfare in the form of um, sanctions and other forms of uh, economic weaponry. And so we were in Nicaragua to study what the U.S. government is currently doing, and, and, and we anticipate a more aggressive sanctions regime to be placed um, on Nicaragua. So Erica, before I let you go, what else should we talk about? What well, have I left out? <laughs> I know we could talk all day. We could talk all day and all night about this. Um, <laughs> but I, I do think it's really important to mention to folks, um, this year there are presidential elections in Nicaragua um, on November 7th, and the US um, government continues to um, use a wide variety of tactics to um, prevent the FSLN from, which has very wide popular support. The most recent polls say it would probably get about 70% of the vote, um, presidential vote um, in the November election. So the US government is doing a, taking a wide variety of tactics to prevent the FSLN from taking power and also includes recognizing that because the FSLN has more so much popular support that it's also thinking about different ways to carry out a coup d'etat. Um, and so that means that the important that, that really strengthens the importance of all of our different organizations, the different media that we're connected to, you know, even our friends and family or communities um, to be alert and pay attention to what's happening in Nicaragua. And really, um, 
I think Terry, <laughs> you'd probably agree the importance of people coming to Nicaragua to see yeah. with their own eyes what's happening. So I know that we have been talking about um, what well, Friends of the ATC has had on our calendar for a long time to continue to do delegations this year. Um, it's it, there are definitely conditions to do delegations here. That Nicaragua has been, uh, of course, not left unharmed by the pandemic, but has been able to address the needs of the pandemic very, very well thanks to its well organized um, public health care system, community based health care models. And so we really hope that folks will come um, both in November for the elections um, to be alert and observe the elections, but also to celebrate with us in July for the um, anniversary of the San Diego Revolution. And as the ATC as an organ, um, you know, as a rural organization working in the countryside, we'll continue to have a number of other exchanges that are looking particularly at food production and agroecology in the countryside. So. Um, we, I think um, Terry and I, we both talked a lot about the importance of bringing young folks to Nicaragua um, and getting them involved I will in say this recent organizing. delegation, nine of the 13, well, not including you, 10 of the 13 of us were significantly younger than me, so <laughs> it was, which was wonderful. It was wonderful. Yeah. yeah, it was great. I mean, about, I think half of the, half of the folks in our group were younger than me. Um, which I think is really, really important because I think young folks have a lot of really important ideas about mm -hmm. um, about solidarity organizing and anti-imperialism and, and can bring a lot of energy into our solidarity organizing and think about more creative creative ways to, to build internationalism between our peoples. And so um, come to Nicaragua, <laughs> especially <laughs> young folks, support young folks in coming here, I think is so key and, and, and through the ATC and friends of the ATC, we feel like one of our key roles is, is supporting, particularly in that area. Wonderful. So watch for a potential delegation in July. Exactly. More to come on that. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, Erica, I'll let you go. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for a wonderful 10 days on the ground here in Nicaragua. It was one of the most amazing delegations I've ever had the honor to be part of. And um, you and your team just did a wonderful, wonderful job hosting us and teaching us so much. And, um, and the diversity of the people in the land, which just so strongly came through. It was just a wonderful, wonderful experience. So I so thank you for that. Thank you so much, Terry, And thank you for having me on, on your program. Okay, everyone, we'll see you uh, next week. I should mention that uh, before we sign off, that every Thursday on WBAI New York City, uh, WPFW Washington DC Code Pink Radio airs at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern. Um, so look for us Thursday mornings on those two Pacifica radio stations and every Wednesday evening, 7.30 p.m. on Code Pink YouTube. So thank you, Erica. Really wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Thank you, bye.